Welcome to Look, Listen, Laugh. Now, my guest today not only created one of the most beloved characters in Australian history, Effie, she's also a great comedian, actress, writer. I recently saw her one-woman show, This Is Personal, and I look forward to sitting down with her and chatting about her favourite album, film, and book. So, enjoy my conversation with Mary Custis. Well... Mary. Here we are. Here we are. Thank you for, for doing this. It's uh, My pleasure. You, you, you know, when I first started doing, thinking about doing this podcast, you're on the, on the list there oh, of thank all you. the people that I wanted to, and it was only a short list initially, but it's growing. It's but, growing. Yeah, yeah. It grows. I didn't want time. to say it was a massive list, and then you were one of the ones on that list. No, it was a short list, oh, and okay. you're at the top of that list. No, no, yeah. no. No, it's definitely, I'm still going to take it in the absolute positive. Yeah. <laughs> And how have you been? You, you've yeah, been. Good. You, 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 you finished up touring for the year. I you, have for the yeah. year. Um, yeah, it was a busy year this year. I had uh, two shows going. Yeah. And I did Dancing with the Stars. Oh wow! How was that? That was crazy. Yeah, it I was would awesome, imagine. and I hated it for the first month, and then sure. once I started getting the hang of it, and you know, I loved it. But yeah, it, it was grueling. It's interesting with those reality shows. I think if you just yeah, because Akmal, uh, he did the I'm a celebrity, get me out of here thing. Right. And he hated it from the beginning and then learned to hate it more oh, as he right. went along. So, yeah, 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 so he didn't. But then like I talked to Tahir, who's done some reality stuff, and he says, no, you just got to give way to it, you know? You just, I mean, once you it. agree, you know what it is, right? But, and, and I'd heard every, everyone said that the first month is crazy on your body. Right. Um, but I, I, I felt like I had another heartbeat in my feet. Oh, like really? every night they'd be outside of the doona and they'd be pulsating, really? just throbbing. So it was the physical element that was the most challenging that, that you found? That and, and trying to learn things you, you, you don't know that yeah, are so sure. intricate and forever changing and trying to look like you're enjoying it when you're trying to remember it all and <laughs> try to trying get to put it right. a smile on while you But it was, it was a great thing to do, you mm. know, um, and I'm glad I did it. Yeah. It's, it, it, I, I was in Russia... Um, like over a decade ago, and a, a friend of mine who's an opera singer was performing at the Bolshoi, and they had um, he was in the opera theater, and they had um, Swan Lake in the in the main uh, main theater. It was like a show that was sold out for months; you couldn't get in. But he's like, "Yeah, we'll just walk in the wings and watch it from yeah, the side." Yeah, yeah, right. So we were watching from the wings. I had a whole new appreciation for ballet dancers and the amount of strength that it takes to pull off these. And, and, and they're all so composed on stage, yeah. and they walk through the wings, and then they're <sighs> yeah. And then they're oh, back on again. Yeah. It's like, wow, just yeah. like you said, maintaining that composure while in agony. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, you know, I saw Swan Lake when I was a kid. That was the first dance I, I ever saw. Right. In fact, possibly the first piece of theatre I ever saw. And uh, it was mind-blowing. And I'm not surprised that um, it's still sold out all over the world. I mean, it's like really unlike anything mm. you know especially as a child sure i mean sure. i grew up in collingwood you know ballet <laughs> wasn't an option self-defense was yeah. but not ballet um <laughs> so yeah it was eye-opening but joel i know this is about me but you always end up somewhere where you shouldn't be you know mm. your stories never go where you think me yeah and um <laughs> we should tell people that we work together yes not, we haven't shared the stage at the same time not at the same time but um we've maybe, maybe crossing as I as, I as i'm walking up and you're walking up we've, we've shared backstage at the yes, same time yes. um but um yeah your, your story is fascinating you're not typical at all no. do, you, do you are you aware of that um yeah i, I somewhat but I, I just sort of see everything i i just kind of go with the flow with a lot of exactly stuff. so rather than like i'm what the hell's happening to you what is this like all right, well, let's, I'll just go with this and see where it takes me. Yeah. And yeah, that's always been my approach since I was a kid. Like, nothing doesn't seem sort of not normal. It's, it's weird, I, I guess. I, was, I, I always had a weird kind of sort of outlook on things, um, curiosity on things, I guess. No, the, I think you're the way. great improviser. You know, you just go, okay, well, I'm here, and what can I do with this, and who can I meet, and, and where does that take me? Yeah. And yeah. I think that that's, that's a sign of confidence. And, um, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want you to be like that if you were a child. Yeah. Put well, it that way. It could be dangerous. Yeah. Well, but I've, I've, I've as an adult, I think it's a great quality. Yeah. Have. Well, as a child, I, I think I've maintained that childhood, that childlike curiosity. It's always been a big thing for me to go, what is that? Oh, I'll just go and do that. You know, yeah. I'll, I'll figure that out. It's like, yeah. I remember when I was a kid, when I was 11, I loved Billy Joel's music, right? So me my, too. The oh, Stranger. Yeah. I'm oh, surprised. It, was, it yes. would have been in my top 10. Oh, really? Totally. Really? I've, I've, I've been buying all of Billy Joel's records on, on vinyl. 
And I just got the, I'm down to two and I got one yesterday. I've just got one final one to go and wow. then I got the whole collection. But that was the first concert I ever saw. So yeah. when you talk about seeing Swan Lake a as a kid, I saw Billy Joel. That yeah. was the first big gathering I'd ever gone to. Yeah. I was blown away. Yeah, like, I saw Alice Cooper. Oh, you did? Oh, fantastic. I, I, I don't know what I thought of it. I remember, you know, with Pride, you know, in the old days, we used to put the, the concert tickets in our photo albums. Yeah. You know, yeah, and yeah, I yeah. think that was a bigger I, thrill than seeing Alice Cooper. Oh, really? Having, having that photo. evidence that you had gone. And yeah. I've been somewhere, man. I've seen stuff. Yeah, but he he was he was pretty revolutionary for his time. He with was. That, the whole welcome to my nightmare and that. Yeah, he was that. like the politically correct Marilyn Manson or yes, something. I don't know yeah. what he was, but he was certainly brought a lot of theatre to it. But that was the era back then. There was, you know, Meat Loaf was. That Bat Out of Hell album, there yes. was, I don't know whether there was anyone that didn't buy it. Mm. You know, it was such a big, you know, th those more theatrical, larger than life, made, you know, made up, made kiss, up kiss, all yeah. that sort of stuff was, you know, which is unlike the album I chose and the artist I chose. <laughs> yes. Uh, which is the opposite of all of that. Totally, totally. Well, we'll get to that shortly. It's uh, but what you chose. This is like, you know, we're keeping them viewing here, like, we got a great album coming up. This is uh, I was it's a excited. Double. When, yeah, it's a double. It's a double album. Th which would be great to take to a desert island. You know, when they say take an album, well, you got twice as much to listen. That's to. right. Yeah. That's right. That's but, right. But the um. My dad said about my mum once um, that if my mother was ever sent to a deserted island and she could only take three things, she would take her pillow, her eyebrow pencil because she doesn't have <laughs> eyebrows and the kitchen sink but I, I might ask her to take this album the double album but she'd have to take a record play and then that's, that's, that's too gone that's too gone and, and then maybe electricity and, yeah no nah, I don't know it. if you had an old gramophone you'd be <laughs> but speaking of your parents I saw your one person show earlier this year phenomenal I was blown away it's a, and the thing is because you've got the chops comedically right on stage because you performing as Effie, it's like, it, it goes because your crowd work is fantastic. And so when, I was, when I've watched you perform on stage, it's like you have the solid material, but then the crowd work on top, and then I go, that's a comedian that I'm watching. You know, as opposed to someone reciting a monologue yeah. or someone reciting like, you have like, because I've seen people do shows before in the guise of stand-up, but it's not a, it's more of a, I know you can see the mechanics working yeah. there, but when I see you work as Effie on stage doing, doing that, you, you're you're coming from a comedian angle on it. Yeah, I mean, I it's so weird. I've been doing comedy for thirty five years, and yet I'm so in awe of people that do comedy. And yeah. then I was like, oh, that's what I do. But I don't see it like that. I mean, it's you don't? I, I don't like to uh, uh, sort of like we're talking about your curiosity about how to. Um, go towards things. I don't like to put scary ideas into my mind and yet I'm constantly playing with scary ideas. Sure, like, sure. oh, go out and do a show for an hour, half of which is not written every night. Yeah. So that's sure. scary, but I don't think of it like that. And I suppose but, but, the I, point, I, yeah. I mean, I'm more of a communicator and I, yeah, I, I love comedy and I love the relief from pain. I love the relief from drama and all of those things. I think comedy is like, you know, the most valuable um, you know, thing you could you mm. could commit to, mm. really, just as a human being, to, mm. to help us through. Um, it is the the ultimate multivitamin, you know. Um, and um, for me, it's been that from the very beginning. But do I think of myself as doing comedy? Obviously, I must because that I sell my shows as comedy, and they are comedic. But for me, particularly with the impro improvisation which I do, is the first half of the show is just really setting up the premise. Right. And really putting Effie in a position where she outs herself constantly mm. um, as, um, as you know, as you would when you, you talk about contradiction, you know, because she's a mass of, of contradictions, as are we all. And so I suppose I deconstruct uh, the premise with Effie in the first half hour. Right. And the, the premise changes with every show. So the last one I did was about COVID. So how did Effie cope with that? Someone who's constantly wanting to be in control. Someone that's all, that's a people um, person that's mm -hmm. that's out doing shows and you know like is like a floated company that everyone has shares in. So how does she yeah. cope with being isolated and in lockdowns and not being allowed to touch and and do all those things that have you know been so much a part of her public life? You know um, how did the isolation work for her and the restrictions? And so then you know that was the COVID show. But shows before that, it was like. 
oh, if he got married, how did she cope with now being sexual because she was a virgin until she got married. So, mm. so uh, that show was about fidelity mm -hmm. uh, or infidelity. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was called Love Me Tinder because what happens on the other side of the fantasy when you finally find the love of your life um, and you've got everything you want and wished for, what happens then? Mm. And mm. that's a question we all ask ourselves, especially when someone like Effie had never even had sex. Sure. Um, uh, and so then she discovered this whole new thing and then she's only got one person to, to do that with now. Um, before that, it was her getting married show, you know, um, in um, Effie the Virgin Bride. And the one before that, looking for love and all the themes that we all battle with sure, at various sure. points in our life. So I take those themes and I deconstruct and show the human side of Effie and the contradictions in her. And then I put it to the audience because they're themes that the audience all struggle right, with. Right. So that's where I get the second half of the show from. And right. for some reason, my audience are so giving. Yes. Like yeah. <laughs> beyond. Like it's, 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 it's more than some sort of priest-like confession. They, t they say it in front of hundreds sure. and hundreds of people every night and they give me half a show. But watching the audience respond to you, it's like they're responding to a friend or someone that they already know. Like you already have that... Like, Effie's one of the most beloved characters. So people, I think, are, I'm watching them in the audience going, yeah, you're right, they're giving all this personal information, but because they're so comfortable with you as Effie, they're, they're so, they're, they're, it's like talking to a friend. Yeah, you know? and they know I'm not judging them. You know, they know that Effie is honest, but not particularly judgmental. Yeah. Like, you know, like she'll go, I, you know, she relates to all sorts of things in a, in a, in a way with her own filter mm, that makes mm. sense to her and that certainly makes sense to the audience. So it's like, essentially, it's like, we're all human. Why don't we fess up? Yes. How funny it is to be human. And, um, and so people give me gold every night. Sure. And I don't think about, when I'm getting ready for the show, I don't think, oh God, there's half an hour which I haven't scripted. Right, At right. all, ever. I don't even entertain that thought because I think something will happen and it you always faith does. In it. Knowing yeah. it's going to be there. It'll work out. Yeah. You know, I'll work it out. Yeah. In the words of you. Because <laughs> yeah. in, uh, I was just finished reading um, uh, Billy Connolly's autobiography, and he talks about that that initial, like when he's backstage, thinking, oh shit, you know, I've got to, I've got to, what am I going to talk about tonight? I'm going to go up there and do two hours. But then having that faith in oneself to go, yeah, yeah, I, I got this. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, it'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. You know, it'll I work. did a show at the Opera House uh, just a, a few weeks ago um, as part of Just for Laughs. And, you know, I don't normally jump on and do, oh, here's seven minutes. Right, right. Like, I'm like, I, I do my shows and I work on my own and, sure. and occasionally I'll do something like that. But it's a novelty for me. I'm not accustomed to it. And I love it because I get to see other people's stuff and I get to hang out backstage. And, and um, there was a lot of young comics, up-and-coming comics there mm -hmm. that were on the bill. And I was watching them and super excited for them and getting to know them and seeing what they do. And, and they were like, oh, my God, you know, you're going to be, you're going to kill it. And it's not that I'm insecure, but no, I just like, well, I've got to find out yeah, if I'm yeah. going to kill it. Yeah, That's why I... you do it every night to find out whether you can kill it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, by, by, by having, saying that, you know, like I've, I'm, a tr I'm trained, I've got, 35 years of experience under my belt, yeah. but I would never assume anything. Yeah. I mean, you go out to find out. Sure. And sure. you earn it every time because someone might say, oh my God, I saw her two weeks ago. She was terrible. Mm. I mean, hopefully not. <laughs> but that, but there's, there's always a chance of that, right? But that's what gives you the edge though, I think. No, because like, like you said, but I never say to anyone, you're going to kill it tonight or I never think I'm going to kill it. It's like, I'll figure it out when I step yeah. on stage, you know? Yeah, but uh, that's why it's live and that's why it's exciting. And, and you know, I, I, I don't know whether I get nervous. I might get nervous on a new show that I haven't done before. And I don't oh, yeah. preview anywhere. Like when, when I see what, how Seinfeld works, where he goes and does five minutes here, five minutes there and works up his hour, mm -hmm. you know, in a torturous manner. And, and relentlessly um, works those five-minute bits and rewrites and does it like that. I don't do it like that because I come from a theatre background, so I just write the show, um, but I do many drafts before I go out and do the first show. Like, I might do anything between five to eight drafts. Right, right. And, and they're harsh. Yeah, you sure. Know? I, my husband is a, you know, is a very good writer. He comes from an advertising background, mm -hmm. so he's a copywriter by trade, and... 
he rips my 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 scripts, you know, to shreds. It's great. He's to like, no, no, nah, nah, not yep. good enough. Where you know you're coming at it better from that angle. But I'll I'll create material that's longer than an hour. Sure. And then keep trimming and trimming mm -hmm. and refining and refining. But I don't test it. You know, the the first test is an hour. And it, that's when you've sold tickets, you're on stage. I'm you're on doing, stage now. And, uh, what about rehearsing? How often do you, do you rehearse uh, a lot I leading don't into re it? I, I rehearse on my own. Yeah. Um, I, I have a director on the big shows. Right. Like if I do, like um, Effie the Virgin Bride was a massive stage show. It's two hours long, multiple characters, just me on my own. Set, wardrobe. You know, audio visual. I have a great director, Craig Eilert, yeah, who I great, love. Craig, he's Craig. awesome. You've yeah. worked with him. Yeah. Um, so I had him and um, and and you know, a production designer, a costume design, like proper theatre stuff, right? Yeah. But the one-hour shows I do as Effie, I don't have a director. Right. But the script, even though it hasn't been tested, has been, you know, looked at a lot and refined a lot. And at some point, you've got to trust experience. And, sure, yeah, you've you know. got to trust the... And also, if they don't laugh at a particular joke that I like, it's still going in. Yeah. You know, I'm not <laughs> going to be a slave to the audience yeah. and think, sure. oh, every joke needs to get an 11 response. Sure. You know, I like, I like, and I like silence, and I like people to be uncomfortable. Yeah. And I like people to, be, to, to go, oh, I don't know where this is going. I like them to be active in mm -hmm. the audience, not just assume that they're just going to be laughing. I mean, that, that's more evident in my Mary show. And, and, and in that show, I wanted them crying. I wanted them worried. I wanted them laughing. I wanted them, you know, going, oh, I didn't see that. Of course that was going to pay off mm -hmm. at some point. You mm -hmm. know, I want them to be along the, on the ride with me at the time. Sure. Not, not sitting back and preempting things. You know? With that show, like, the release... You, 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 uh, which was great watching how numerous times like you would be in a very serious place and the audience is like, like holding their breath and then you would hit it with a laugh and that release would then spike the laugh even more so just to, ah, oh, and which was a great metaphor too. It's that cathartic thing of using mm. humour to deal with tragedy or to deal with... Totally. And, you know, that's why inappropriate laughter is one of the best things ever invented. Yeah. You know, like in the wrong situation when the pressure is on and it's so tense or dramatic or something is happening, just the, the desire to want to laugh, even mm -hmm. though you know it's the wrong thing, mm -hmm. is there to save us. It's our, you know, as much as it, you know, might cost us a bit sure. in terms of other people's response. But, and we know the price could be high, but there's nothing like that laughter yeah. to sort of get us through. You know, it's, it oxygenates us. Sure. Um, and, you know, and that's what I've used humour for my whole life. You know, I've, I've, I've used humour, like most people, to go to the, the heavy stuff and to carbonate it mm -hmm. and to, to lift me out of it for a minute, to give me just a breather of standing back and trying to watch it and not be in it. Sure. Uh, and performing does that. It's such a great uh, way to observe life, you know, and to recreate it. And to watch people, um, you know, as one become one mm -hmm. and have the same experience. When I did um, the Mary show, this is personal. The, the, I did it in Canberra, and I'd never performed there. Weirdly, I don't think I'd ever done a show in Canberra. I did lots of corporates there. You but never I'd... took the Effie show to Canberra. No, wow. weirdly, I don't know why. Is there I, a great I always, audience in Canberra. I always right? felt like I never knew what the right venue was, right. and so it felt too hard. And I was like, oh, some people say that one, but then I heard, that. you know, like. Well, you, you picked a great one with this, the uh, yeah. Canberra Theatre. Yeah, 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 I loved yeah, it. Yeah. And uh, there was a woman that was in the cafe next to the hotel where I was staying. Uh, the next morning, my husband and, and um, my daughter and I went in to have breakfast and she was sitting there and she was talking about the show to people that hadn't seen it. And she said to me, do you have any idea how many men were crying in your mm, show? Mm. And I said, I'm aware of it, but I don't focus on it. You know, I don't want to be taken out of it. You know, like you, there's a certain percentage of your consciousness that is devoted to what's happening in the audience. But at most it should be. I don't think it should be more than 5 to 10%. Right. You've got to Otherwise, stay within what you're experiencing. Particularly a show that's that emotional for sure. me. But the audience experiences that through your experience too. So you're right in saying that you have to keep, you know, keep that internalised with what's going on within you in order for that to reach the audience. Yeah. Whereas if you're focused too much on what the audience is, then there's a disconnect. Uh, yeah. Uh, and you've got to trust that, that they trust in you to take them where they need to go. Right. That's what... That's why they're coming to see see someone that they have faith in that mm -hmm. is going to make them feel things. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you've got to trust that 
you know, uh, unless that, that we're, I, I like to think of myself as the surrogate, you know, like I'm the person that they're going to feel safe, will go through all the feelings, mm -hmm. and while they think they're watching me go through it, they don't realise that they're going through mm -hmm. it. That there comes a point very early on that it's actually about them, it's no longer about me. And they feel safe that they think it's about me. Mm, and so mm, when they walk out mm. of that show, it brings up a lot mm -hmm. about them. And it, you know, it, it's illuminating and reinforcing and comforting to, to watch me be the person that took the first step you know, sure. in, into that arena on their behalf. But then they, they, they know that actually they were tricked at some point. Mm. I think that's a good point that you made too, to, for the audience to know they're in good hands. I think that's so important for performers of all aspects, from what you did with the One Woman Show to when you're performing as Effie to, say, a musician or whoever, to know that you're in good hands is, allows the audience to give way. Whereas if, they, if, if you don't get that across, then there's this, I don't know, this disconnect that... Well, it's funny because, you know, um, I used to watch a lot of theatre sports when, when I first started acting professionally, I, I was dating a guy who was one of the best improvisers in the country. In fact, he went to perform at the theatre sports, you know, world blah -de blah in yeah. Montreal right. and represented Australia. So I wasn't improvising much around that period and nor did I ever think I could do something as challenging as theatre sports. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a variety of different uh, exercises and premises that you're supposed to, you know, improvise with others. Mm. And because certainly for the last... 25 years I've been working pretty much on my own. I can't improvise with others unless it's the audience. Right. right. Um, so, um, and you would watch people that were so skilled but not likeable. Mm. And you'd see the audience going, yeah, okay, there's a person that just rhymed with orange. Mm. Not an easy word to rhyme with. But I like that guy and no matter what he says, and even though he's not as skilled, I really like the vibes on that guy or that girl. So you realise that likability or trust is, mm -hmm. is a very different thing to skill. Yes, yes. Um, hopefully you got both. There was a great improv teacher, Del Close, who was, um, he taught you know, Bill Murray, um, John Belushi said everything he knew about comedy he learned through wow. Del. And uh, he was, uh, there was a book um, written about him called The Funniest One in the Room and it was, it was great. It was just his thoughts on comedy and on improv and... And when you said before, not necessarily going for the laugh all the time, and which, which he was all about, he said, don't always go for the mm. cheap laugh. And he said, especially the cheap, you go, elevate the audience to your level. Don't stoop yourself yeah. to yeah. pander. Yeah. And, and he, said, um, he said too that like, forsaking a laugh in order to maintain the integrity of the character is what's the most important yeah, thing. Yeah, totally. So, I think it's a real sign of insecurity to always have to be chasing the laugh. Right. I think. Right, um, right. And I, I don't like it. I want more than that. Of course I want to laugh. Mm. But I, I want to earn that laugh. I want to, you know, get to it. I don't want to assume it's going to be there. And look, I was born out of a sitcom, or Effie was. Sure. And in a sitcom, there's a rhythm of laughs that sure. you've got to, you know, like an audience knows, it's almost musical, mm -hmm. that, that there should be a laugh every X amount of seconds. So, but um, I remember an actor I worked with said, just give them what they want. And I said, no, mm -hmm. I'm going to give them what I want. Mm -hmm. And I, I reckon we've got the same taste. They don't know what they want. It's like asking a child what a child wants. Mm -hmm. A child doesn't know. It's going to throw you some options. They're going to be, you know the ones that you're not going to want to give, you know, like, of course I'm going to want sugar every meal. Of course I'm going to want, you know, like, you know, junk food every meal. A, sh a kid's not going to go, actually, give me a salad. Yeah. You know, and a mineral water <laughs> a with a slice of, <laughs> slice of lime. Yeah. But, you know, like, so it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing of who's controlling who. Right. And, and it's a recipe that you're not conscious of and you, and you, and you cook up the dish all the time and, and, um, but, but you know when it works. Mm -hmm. And if you had to break it down, you could intellectualize it. But yet if you were to build it back up through the intellectualizing, it doesn't amount to the same dish. Yeah, sure. So who knows? Yeah. And how did you find with doing yourself Mary show as opposed to doing the Effie show, like going into that in terms of from a performance perspective? Yeah, I, was, like, it was, I was so scared. Right. I, I can't... I didn't know how to do it. I mean, I... I, I very successfully hidden behind Effie for a long time and all my other characters when I do stage shows I 
I do other characters as well. Um, but Effie's the one that's known. She was the one that was on television. So sure. I was not in a hurry to, to get to Mary. But too many people that I'm close to that have watched what I've done and know me really well go, like, it's time, you know, like, you need to put Mary out there. I'm like, in what way and how? Mm. And and I'm a pretty serious person. I'm like, without comedy, I'd be so hideous to be around. Like, <laughs> I, I look at life through a pretty serious lens. Sure. I mean, thank God, it, you know, there's there's a little shaft of comedy that comes in constantly to to add light to that to that way of looking sure. at the world. But um, so I, I was like, well, how does, how, how does Mary get to be funny and what does that look like? And, and so um, it was a process mm. of just putting together the things that I thought that had shaped me or informed what I do. Right. Um, and I came from a world of very funny people. Uh, most of us do. Um, you know, they, they weren't professionals. But they were Greeks, which is the next best sure, thing. Sure, sure. They're theatrical, they're outspoken, they're full of character, they're wise, they're all the things that I like in human beings. They're playful, they're ridiculous, they're unafraid, they're hardworking, they're well-meaning. You know, they're all the, that great combination of, of things. Um, so um, I just sort of spoke to people that knew me and my world that, that also know how to put shows together. And I landed on uh, a friend of mine who I hadn't worked with since Acropolis. Oh, actually, he, he script edited my, my first one-woman show. Um, he's a screenwriter. His name's Chris Anastasiadis, and he's brilliant. And he's essentially just been writing great films. And, and I said to him, you know, this opportunity's come up for me to do something at the Opera House. They don't want Effie, they want Mary. And it's something that's been a question mark that's been floating around in my mind. Maybe I should do this. I've been pushed and shoved by people who I respect and who know, you know, what I'm capable of and I think it's time and will you help me with this? And he went, absolutely. He knows my family. He knows right. my work world. He was part of the beginning of it in such a fundamental way. Uh, he knows how to structure. Mm -hmm. So I would just send him everything that came to mind, uh, material, stories, characters, situations, um, you know, and I would write them as little scenes and things, but, you know, or phrases. And then uh, it was my daughter's birthday. Um, it was, must have been her eighth. And I remember she was getting picked up by a friend and taken to school. And, and she goes to a school where you have to wear a uniform and she was in mufti. So she was just wearing sort of normal clothes. And I got her some cupcakes for her class. And I remember sending her off and coming back to sit to write this show that I knew was going on, you know, only months and, mm, you know, six mm. months later. But I wanted to, I needed extra time to write it because I didn't, I, could, I didn't know what I was building. And I remember having a thought as I opened my computer, it just hit me. And I ran into the bathroom where my husband was taking a shower and said, I know what it's about. Mm. I can see it. Mm. You know, and I, and I realized I shared the same dilemma as my father. Now, my father was dying from before I was born. Mm. So here I was suddenly with the same dilemma that no matter what choices I made, no matter, the, you know, like I'm in his shoes. And mm -hmm. that was that I became a mother at 49 mm. after 23 IVFs. Mm. At 49, separate to the fact that Death was something I was aware of even before I knew about other concepts because of my dad's health. Sure. And here I am now trying to do what my dad tried to do for me, which is to prepare me for life without him. Mm. And here I am, nothing more, but thank God, you know, I don't have the illness that he had. But at 49, you've got to think about, okay, there might be a chunk of time where my, my child doesn't have me in their life. Sure. So I realised on her birthday that the show was about trying to prepare her for life without me. Mm. So that was one of the big threads that really appeared and that gave me one of the spines. So, you know, working out how you're going to tell a story is, I, I think, the most difficult part of storytelling. Sure. Especially now, audiences are very sophisticated about how they inherit stories. Right. You know, like it, the form has changed so much where you see it from multiple timelines and multiple points of view mm -hmm. and 
And I knew I wanted to, t to say a lot in an hour and there was no impro with this show. Right. So I needed to really expose a life and a perspective in an hour mm -hmm. that wasn't indulgent. That right. was of value to the audience. But it was very, it's a good point that you make because at no point did it ever feel indulgent. And you were, there was a lot of great personal exploration in there without it becoming... And the key is that you were able to make the audience feel their own experiences through what you were doing. And which is, it's not an easy feat, you know, to pull that off, to be able to make it seem so authentic and, uh, and, and not contrived. And, and although you're using theatrical techniques with lighting and sound and all of that, but it, you, you never felt taken out of the story through that. You know? Well, I didn't want it to be indulgent. I didn't want it to be a vanity piece. And when, you, when you're putting your whole life into an hour, it can easily tip over into yeah. that. And my question I always ask before I sit down to write a show is, what's in it for the audience? Mm. That's my starting point. Yeah. Like, what do they walk away with? I don't want them just watching me. I might as well be a model. Well, that's not going to happen. But you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, sure. I've got, they've yeah got to walk away with more than what they arrived. Mm -hmm. It's like going to Bali. You know how you end up with more money than what you went with? Like, mm -hmm. uh, there were points when I first went to Bali going, did I actually spend any money? Like, were things that cheap? Or how yeah. did I end up with more than what I left? You know, right. like, it's one of those, like, wonderful equations of, you know, um, of where you invest mm. and what you get back. Sure. And they should have invested whatever the ticket price was and got a lot more back. Mm -hmm. Otherwise... It's just an insecure person standing on a stage trying to get looked at for an hour. Sure. And I didn't sure. want to do that. That's not the skill. But that, that would have that... been very easy for you to do. Like, you, you look, I'm a Logie award-winning <laughs> uh, actor, comedian, uh, you know, the first character of its kind on Australian TV. You could have rattled out all of these, you know, and that, big, and that, big accolades. A, a bit but, like and, and being a gone. victim in life. You know, I always say, you know, and I try to tell my daughter this, you know, pity will buy you um, attention once, mm. <laughs> yeah. never again. Once yes. someone goes, oh, no, mm. uh, Joel's pulling out the violin again. Yeah. Um, let's let, let, yeah. Actually, I'm this really is, busy. Yeah, I can't catch up. Yeah. So I think that that's that, you know, if there is no value in it, the audiences won't come back. And that's an important point, I think, that you make too, where, and I, I assume this must have been a quality you instilled from your parents, the, which was the idea of, I'm not going to play the victim here. I'm not, it's not going, this ain't going to be a woe is me story. I'm going, to, I'm going to get on with the job at hand and make this work. And, and you know, with your mum coming out to, to Australia, doesn't speak the language. She's by herself. She's getting off a plane in this foreign land. But she figures it out. She makes it work. She's not going, woe is me at, at Look, any point. Look, she, she cried every night, she said, for the first two years when she arrived. Right. Um, so she was sad, but she didn't play the victim. And there is There's a difference. Two different, yeah, yeah, two different between things. Between that. Yes. You can be heartbroken and you can feel that, you know, things are hard without feeling like it was a deliberate um, attack on you, you know. Sure. Like they're just things that's part of, that, that's just part of life. You know, uh, the Greeks have a saying, and I have a, a, a boy bestie that always wants me to translate word for word from Greek into English without trying to, you know sandpaper the edges, mm. uh, this is what life contains. Like there is no avoiding, you know, that, 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 that shit's going to happen sure. to all of us. Sure. And, and sometimes you look at somebody else's life and you think, oh, you know, they don't know the shit that I know, but you don't know what's ahead for that person. Mm -hmm. So at, at whatever point, you know, you're going to find yourself out of your depth and out of your mind and, and broken mm. and you either rebuild or, or you make that, you know, the sort of the, the final act upon your character. Mm. And I just didn't see the benefits for me um, when life's been hard for me um, to, to play the victim. I, I, none of it was done deliberately to me. Mm. It's just mm. happened because mm. there's risk involved in anything. Mm. And if you take the risk, then, then you've got to be prepared not to win sometimes. Sure. And do you find your, your daughter picking up those? Because uh, uh, I know in the show, like you, you talked about instilling these qualities in your daughter, like that were instilled from your parents. Do, how, how does that? Look, when you're in love with your dad, like I was with mine and like she is with hers, mm. you know, you want to play the damsel, right? Because, you know, he, he's going to come and save you and he's, oh, what happened? And oh, look, maybe we'll fix that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, there is something in in little girls wanting their dads to, to play that role. You mm -hmm. know, it's the first prince. 
you know. Yeah. Just as long as you, 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 you're aware that, you know, possibly no one is ever going to love you as much as, you know, your dad. Mm. And, um, and that that might work with him, but it possibly won't work with others. Right, know? right. So, so I, try, I try to not encourage any um, self-pity. Right, right. Well, it's, well, the messages in your show was, uh, had a real humanity to it. And which for me links up to your favorite album, mm. which is full of those real messages, you know, the, uh, and it's not like, yeah, they're personal messages, but universal messages as well. And that album is none other than... Songs in the Key of Life by Stevie Wonder. And this is such a beautiful copy. This is just fresh. Uh, mine's battered and bruised. I've played it that many times. This was the first album I bought. I bought it with my brother. And um, we were living in the white middle class um, suburbs of Doncaster right. uh, in Melbourne, um, which the, the Greeks hadn't gone to at that point. They're, they're now all over it. But when we went in the early 70s, we were very much in the minority. And um, there weren't a lot of performers in the world that look like me unless you were looking at Greek performers in Greece and we didn't have access to internet or know who the big stars were apart from the occasional movie that we would be dragged to. So um, I felt very um, enlightened and comforted by uh, an African-American black man that was blind that could see so much, mm. you know. And this so this album, this double album, it... The artists that I that I then went on to fall in love with Prince and George Michael mm -hmm. and Elton John and and, and incredible artists. Um, this is their favorite album. Mm. So there are a lot of um, people that were influenced by this as much as me. For me, I remember watching Roots, the miniseries. Yes, that that was haunting and um, life changing for me. So. Um, you know, my experience of racism and bullying was nothing in comparison to the stories that I was watching and, and was moved by. Um, I suppose um, why I loved Stevie Wonder so much, he, he put such a potent pill mm. um, of race and into such a joyous, um, you know, capsule. Mm. He, he puts... You know, if, if you weren't listening to the lyrics, you'd think he was saying something super positive. Um, but what he's, what he's saying is these are the people that have changed the world that are unacknowledged mm. in some of the songs. Mm. This is what uh, we've had to survive. This is how we're perceived. Um, and still puts so much joy around that. Mm. It's a very optimistic love letter to his culture and to the world, mm. I think. And that's what I needed to hear at that time. So, and it's timeless. Musically too, it's like you listen. You could listen to it today. It holds up beyond you know most of the the music that's released today. Um, I I like artists that dare to say something, and I know that's not the case for many. Mm. Um, we saw Dave Chappelle the same night. Yes. Remember we bumped into yes. each other out the front. Um, I like philosophical Dave. Some people like just funny Dave, uh, yes. and there is an argument because there were four of us that were there that mm. night. My husband. And another person, and and me, and, and and a friend, and two of us didn't like it, didn't like Dave that mm. night, mm. even though we're massive fans, mm. and the other two did because they thought he was just jokey Dave, mm. and I'm like, I really like philosopher Dave. That you uh, got a couple nights later. Apparently, yeah. Yeah. At, at the um, I went to the, the documentary. Fox. Yeah, at Fox. Um, yeah, he was yeah. there that night. Right. That Dave, my favourite Dave. So it depends what you want. I don't mind an artist having to comment on the world. I think that's a, that's a big role of art is to comment on, on what's out there. Mm. You know, and a lot of people say, oh, I don't care about a famous person's beliefs about this or that. But I think if you have a platform, you know, yeah, use it. Yeah, communicate if you, it. If you can put something good out there separate to what you do for a living or if you can, if you can combine the two, mm. that's the ultimate for me. Mm. And I feel like I, I wouldn't have a career if I hadn't spoken about race. And the boys that I did all the work with at the beginning of my career, Nick and George and Simon, mm -hmm. it was that same common desire to put ourselves on the map somehow, mm -hmm. to, to make ourselves be seen. And that's why Wogs Out of Work was such a humongous hit. Sure. Um, because we're in the shadows. We weren't even acknowledged. We, we didn't exist, apparently, in, in the public sphere. Sure. So then Acropolis Now put it out there in such a, a fun 
way with the sitcom that we did for Channel 7 for all those years, that people fell in love with, with us and wanted to be like us. Mm -hmm. And that's the next sure. level of success. When you think, okay, here's the first one. Wogs Out of Work was, this is who we are. This is how funny we can be. These are our issues. Let's put it out there. And then Acropolis Now was, let's enjoy all of that. We represent that. We don't have to speak to that as much anymore because just physically by being in a show, we are saying all of that. Sure. And it became sort of aspirational and people wanted, you know, friends like us or why, why can't we be more like that, outspoken mm. and, and, and honest and, and so full of love and joy. So I really like that combination. You know, I'm a big fan of chili and I like salty and sweet. Sure. I don't want just something sugary. I like the mix of flavors sure. in, in everything. And so that's why Stevie Wonder was such an influential artist for me. And I think it's how you communicate it too. Like he communicates, like we were talking before, when you know you're in good hands. Yeah. With Stevie, you know you're in good hands. And in other hands, the things that he communicates, like, of course, we all believe, well, any person that has any humanity, humanity to them believes, yes, treat people equally, treat people from, with love and kindness and compassion. But in the wrong hands, communicating that can be, oh, God, here we go. Yeah, this whole bloody, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. this whole thing again. Whereas when it's communicated well and creatively, yeah. it hits you deep. It's not just a slogan that someone's throwing out yeah. there. Yeah. And, and I feel with like, the songs in this album, like, he just nails it perfectly. Incredible. It's incredible. There are some super light songs and there are some that, that literally list the, you know, the incredible um, impact um, that certain individuals had on, on the world that mm. have been unacknowledged. Mm. Incredible. I mean, he's just so awesome. Love him. Yeah, like Can't get enough. Well, that moves us on to another film, oh, no, another piece, which is a film that had a big impact, Academy Award winning yeah. film. Yeah, and, and not an obvious choice. No, but a great film. Um, Moonstruck. I love this film. It is an incredible film because I don't think ensemble gets done as brilliantly as it does in this film. Every mm, person mm. in this film stars in this film. Yes. And even there's no though small part. There's nothing. E everything is so well executed and thought out. Every character has an opportunity to shine. Um, they are irreplaceable. Um, Cher, who, you know, I had a, a horse when I first went to Doncaster because I wanted to blend in because I thought <laughs> if I got a horse, people wouldn't notice this. Right. <laughs> uh, I'd be the horsey girl like all the Anglo girls. Um, and my horse was called Sunny because of Sunny and Cher, not right. because of the weather. Um, so I was a big fan of, you know, Cher uh, as just as a pop star and muso. But she's brilliant in this. She brilliant. Is. She won an yeah. Academy Award for this. Uh, Nicolas Cage. Yeah, fantastic. Early just, Nicolas Cage, you couldn't touch him. He's got that brooding kind of Stanley Kowalski element to totally. it. Totally. You know? uh, ridiculous. Out yeah. of control. The man with the wooden hand. Yeah. Um, Danny Aiello, who plays his brother. That's great. Johnny Camareri, who's as bad as <laughs> thick as, you know, a million bricks. And so yeah. lovable and dumb. Yeah. Um, and the, the... The mother, Olympia Dukakis. The Olympia Dukakis, the great, great Greek actress um, yeah. who... Uh, is incredible in this. She got nominated for this. Um, uh, you know, everyone in this is is so brilliant. It is so quotable. This film, mm -hmm. and it's a family favourite. We we use a lot of the dialogue in this film um, every day. You know, in various ways. Incredible, fun and film. The way the dialogue is delivered too, because the playwright or well, who wrote this, John Patrick Shanley. I've seen some of his plays before, and it's that rhythm that you got to be on. And if you like, you were saying before with. Um, with the sitcom, there was a, there, there is a there was a rhythm to that in delivery, and if you're off that rhythm, the joke falls flat. Yeah. It doesn't work. So a lot of the dialogue in this is it is like a joke. You've got to find that rhythm and timing to make it. To do make you it land. do you remember the scene where she goes to tell her parents that she's been proposed to? <laughs> well, firstly, she the mother's upstairs asleep. The father is an insomniac. She comes home. She says, "I'm engaged to two. Johnny Camareri. Johnny Camareri's a big baby. <laughs> Where's the ring? She shows the ring. It's a pinky ring. <laughs> you know, like everything's temporary. <laughs> yeah, Vincent Gardenia. Uh, um, I think he won Best Support f for that, the guy that plays the father. Yes. They go upstairs, they wake up the mother who died. 
Yes. Is it for, you know, <laughs> you know, um, no, yeah. it, Loretta's getting married. Again, it didn't work for you the first time. Do you love him, Loretta? You know, because if, if you do, they break your heart. Yeah. Because yeah. she knows her own husband is having an affair. She hasn't, mm, she hasn't mm. confronted him about it. Which is a yeah. nice little tell. In, Brilliant. In yeah. Everyone's story is complicated and, and beautifully intersects at various points. Mm. Um, the dialogue, like you said, it's in that rhythm of, yeah. you know, lovable outrage. Yes. You know, and looking for answers. And Cher chooses a safe guy in marrying this, this guy because her first husband got run over by a bus. Right. Which is funny in itself. <laughs> uh, and then the guy that she gets engaged to says, you need to go talk to my brother. I need him at our wedding. I need we to have make good. Yeah. I need to make good. Tell yeah. him. And then she goes and meets the brother and then things get super complicated. Yes. Because he's hot with a wooden hand. And we'll and literally in front of the furnace, you yeah, know, yeah. sweating in a singlet. Brilliant. You know, he, he's got the muscles. He's, you know, yeah. Leave the nothing attitude. but the bones. Yeah. <laughs> that that climactic scene hits. Leave nothing but the bones. Um, brilliant film. Love it. Full of comedy. Full of character. Full of um, great actors. And it, and it's one of those. Like, I remember because my mum loved this film when I was a kid, and I remember watching it numerous times because I think it was '87 it came out, and yeah, just and just knowing then, and not necessarily. Or everything landing with me as a kid, but I still knew enough to know, yeah, this is fantastic. I'm watching quality here. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, I could have gone with The Godfather, which I loved. Oh, likewise. I could have gone yeah. with Cinema Paradiso, which yes. I've chosen before on something else if they right. ask me, because I love that film so much. There, 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 there is just so, it's so hard to choose. The Godfather is another one. I remember watching that as a kid. I, I, I would just go and find these like Brando. I was just enamoured with when I was younger. And not, not that I understood all the subtleties and everything, but I just knew I'm watching something special here. Yeah. This is, this is this. Like, for me, when I ever watched those people that were that good, I was like, they know the secret. I don't know what. Oh my God, you're adorable. I don't know adorable. what it is, but it they was like. They know like, the scene. Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I have to watch this. I have to pay attention to this. So, and is this something on, on a, on a no, it wasn't on an intellectual level. It was on this subliminal level. I knew this is quality. This is something I need to pay attention to. Yeah. And they do. You know, it's funny that you should say that because I saw Meryl Streep a million years ago mm. get interviewed by Oprah. And Oprah said to her, why you every time, you know, like, you know, mm. nominated a million times, every time whatever Streep does, like, lands brilliantly. Mm. And a, the secret idea came up and she said, tell me what, what it is. And Streep said, I always have a secret about mm. the character that I don't share with anyone, not the director, mm. not the writer, no one. Mm. For instance, in Kramer versus Kramer, she never loved him. Hmm. And when you watch that film, she's cold. Mm. And Dustin Hoffman, all your loyalties go with Dustin Hoffman in that mm. film because mm. she is cold. She never loved him. Mm. You know, so of course the divorce was going to be cold and ugly and, sure. you know, she was always removed because she, in her mind, played it like she's never loved him. Mm. Uh, we don't know that when we wa we're watching it. Sure. But you get something. you like, something else is going on. It's right. that secret, right? Right, right. And she was great. She, she is great with choices. Like the... And that's what I think what makes the greats, the choices that they make, that are just that little subtlety that isn't in the script, but like you said, like that goes beyond, you know, what, what's on the page. Yeah. And I, there's a, the, the Lincoln Center in, um, New in, in New York, which the Lincoln Center where they go yes. and watch the, watch the opera. There's, um, there's a great library there where they have all of the Broadway productions on camera that you can go in there and... Like an archive, you yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and you go in and, and you give an excuse for why you want to see it. And they're like, there you go. And I'd always heard about the Seagull, uh, production of the Seagull directed by Mike Nichols with... Um, Brilliant. Natalie Portman as Nina, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman as Constantine. Um, I had, um, uh, 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 I think, Kevin Klein was in it. And... Um, and there was the, the mother was Meryl Streep. Wow. And it was just like, it, with a Mike Nichols uh, production yeah. too. And yeah. it was, uh, so I sat down and watched it. And there's a scene where, because it's interesting the dynamic between Constantine and his mother where she's, she secretly hates her son because it reminds her of her age. And she always wants to be youthful. Yeah. And there's, 
a great scene where she's demonstrating, like, I'm still youthful. And she just threw this part in where Meryl does this cartwheel, mm. you know, to show that she's still... Yeah. But as she's walking away from it, she just brings her hand around to her yeah, back yeah. and just like, leans in a bit on her back. I thought, wow, that's just such a brilliant yeah. choice to communicate. Yeah. Yes, she is old. It's not the son's fault. You're using him as an excuse to, to blame your age on. And, 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 that just, and, and just her choice of communicating that, just in that subtle little move, I was like, ah, oh, brilliant. Another film which I love, love, love is Terms of Endearment. Similar yes. reasons to this. Yes. It's, it's heavier because... Um, James L. Brooks, right? He, he did, yes. He, yeah. uh, and um, Shirley MacLaine yeah. plays a woman that's ageing. She's mm. got those little Muppet characters that adore her that mm -hmm. they never uh, you know when she's celebrating her birthday never would they ever think to mention the number mm -hmm. she didn't want to be a grandmother mm -hmm. she becomes one reluctantly she has a very complex relationship with her daughter who then is dying of cancer yes. which only heightens everything um and she is repulsed by the astronaut who lives next door jack nicholson jack nicholson yes um, yet another film like this, brilliant ensemble, brilliant conflict, you know, um, heartbreaking, hilarious. Mm. But yeah, a lot of those same things that, you know, the, the opening scene when she's, you know, it's, it's a flashback of when her daughter was born where mm. she goes into the, the bedroom and she looks into the cot to see if the baby's breathing. Mm. And she can't tell because you can tell she's neurotic, just sets mm -hmm. up the character brilliantly. She pinches the baby, the baby cries, she's happy, she exits the room and closes the door. Um, but yeah, that'd be another one I'd have there for those same reasons of, you know, uh, of building characters that are so um, understandable and relatable and not obvious mm. in, in those little sort of insecure things mm. of of where do our issues stem from and, and, and do they stem from vanity? Mm. And do, do all issues have to go through you? Mm. You know, mm. to, you know, why does everything... I was thinking about jealousy. I was thinking about how it says more about, you know, insecurity than it says about anything. You know, mm. and I'm, I'm mm. you know, if you want to be competitive, fine. No problem. Mm. Although I believe in life we compete against ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the only competition in, the li in life that right. we're really, if we were to be completely honest. But why are some people jealous and some people aren't? Mm. And I would imagine that the only answer is insecurity. You know, right, like it, right. it's more a reflection on, on the you and thing. what you, your deficit mm -hmm. rather than what the other person's doing. Yeah, that's, uh, I've often thought like I'm not competitive enough myself with other people. I'm happy. If someone, I know how hard it is to achieve stuff, especially in our field. And if someone achieves it, well done. Good yeah. luck to you. Run with it, you know. Yeah. But then I've felt... I uh, should be more competitive because then I'll, it'll give me a kick up the arse more to be more, make more of myself, you know. But I am competitive with myself. I have a level that I set for myself. But I often think, yeah, because I, I see some friends who are, you know, fellow comedians who are competitive and it gives them drive and pushes them. Yeah, but to, to, to what point, you know, like mm. I, 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 I see you and you're always doing you're not a person that's lazy, so it's not mm. like you're not out there doing stuff. You're doing stuff all the time. Mm. You're touring, you're writing, you're, you're doing this now. Like, at what point do you need more assistance with any of that? Like, yeah. you, if, you, if you're, comp you're still doing it anyway. Yeah, you're just yeah, yeah. as productive. Sure, you're just sure. not motivated by revenge yeah. or motivated by insecurity. Mm. And, and I, I've had people that I worked with that said, you're too much of a fan. You need to be more of a diva. You know, this was years and years ago that because I'm so supportive of others mm, and what they mm. do. But they don't realise that that's where I get my inspiration. I yes. don't sit there and, and uh, I was never the girl that put posters of artists in my bedroom. Look look at who I loved, mm. you know. Um, I, I, did, I wasn't like David Cassidy or, yeah, right. or whoever yeah. the spunk, who, Leaf the Garrett. Yeah, you yeah. know, <laughs> I was never that girl. I wanted to be that girl, right. but I was never that girl. I can only find true inspiration from those around me that I know are th three-dimensional beings. Mm. They're not some, you know... Cardboard cutout. Something yeah. I, I can't ever get my head around. Right. Like, they, they could be pretty to look at, but they could be an arsehole or they could be, you know, a pedophile. I don't know who they are. Sure. I don't know what they get up to, you sure, know? Sure. So I, I can say, oh, I like the music, but I'm really not going to be devoted to them. Right. Um, so for me, it's about the people that I know and getting that inspiration. So I need that fuel from watching others do well. Yeah. You know, 
be, I'll do it anyway, but it, it just gives me more. Sure. So I don't really see it as a negative, uh, but I see a lot of people that do really well by, you know, by being jealous or competitive mm. in a negative way, you know. Um, they, they wouldn't say that they're inspired. I see a lot of men do really well with revenge. Revenge right. can be a good steroid to success, I think. Right, right. But it's too much weight to carry. You know, yeah, with, just... with all of the, all that baggage that comes with jealousy and revenge and all that, it's like, ah, uh, like, and I've been, uh, believe me, I've been in situations where I have felt upset initially about what someone's done, like, when I was like, how does someone behave or do something like that? Like, I can't, trying to get my head around it, but then I'm just like, I'm letting all this go, you take it, you can have it all, you do what you need to do, I'm, I don't want to carry this weight, yeah. you know, I don't, yeah. it's, what, at the end of the day, what is it, how does that serve me of being yeah. jealous and pissed off and carrying that weight, let it go, you know, move forward. It's true. <laughs> yeah. So speaking of uh, life lessons and people who take a sense of uh, humanity behind the decisions that they make, uh, especially considering other people, that brings us to the book that you've selected, yes. which has many great uh, life lessons for us all, none other than... To Kill a Mockingbird. Wow, yeah. Look, if I had to choose a book that haunted me, mm. it would have been 1984 by George Orwell. Oh. My God, I read that. And I didn't have anything to hide, but I was terrorised by that book uh, still. Mm. Well, and rightfully so. It was, uh, it was Nostradamus. I, I was going to say that it was very proth prophetic of him. Yeah. How do you feel now with <laughs> seeing the way the world is now in terms of what was written in George Orwell's Work. Yeah, I suppose the, the more sinister nature of us being numbers and wearing the uniform and, you know, all those sorts of, you know, cold elements. Mm. Uh, now we think we're free and even though we're, we're um, being targeted and, and, um, and they know they, they is bigger than ever. They mm -hmm. used to be, a th I used to think they were a, a, a well-to-do couple that lived in a cul-de-sac right. that were sort of somewhat like uh, half scientists, half, you know, philosophers that would put out their, their theories every day and then we would just inherit them somehow. But mm. no, that they need seems to be a lot bigger than ever before. Mm. They seems to be, you know, government and, you know, multinationals and, sure, and, and sure. any, anything that comes with an algorithm or, mm -hmm. you know, or a listening device or a photographic device. Mm -hmm. Look, it is what it is. We take the conveniences and we try not to focus on the negatives, but really, what have I got to hide? Well, Even though I don't like being monitored too much, but what have I got to hide, really? That's what I said to my brother the other day. I was talking to him on the phone. I said, who cares what we're talking about? What, they want to listen to this, listen to the conversation. Like, it's, like you know, because, you know, you know, they can listen and I said, yeah, but, okay. <laughs> Like, well, they're, 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 yeah, they're just going to go, who's this weirdo? What is he yeah, on about? Yeah, this one's boring yeah, next. Yeah, move on. Uh, but it is interesting, though, I find how we, as a society and people in general, willingly will give the information away. Like on Facebook, it's like so much info. Oh, I'm feeling depressed today. Woe is me, blah, blah, blah. You're giving all these inner thoughts away. And it's like, yeah, that, that was stuff that I used to think, keep something for yourself. You yeah, know? I know, but what are friends for? Like, like just go and have a coffee and download sure, Yeah, yeah. Like, why is out into the world and this, oh, or, or the humble brag you see, especially now, in the, the humble brag, so honoured to be blah, 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 yada, yada. It's like, okay, well done. You know, it's just, like maybe once every so often. Yeah, I get it. You sold out the gig. Fantastic. Well done. But continuously, yeah. all of this is like, yeah. Oh, just well, that's where the addiction is, and that's that's where it, you know, when it turns, it turns. And um, anyway, this this book has got nothing to do no, with we, anything we, like yes, that. It's, um, maybe it was on the syllabus at school. Sometimes mm, they get it right. Yeah. You know? um, I don't remember all of them, but I remember this one. I think uh, it was such a great film too, To Kill a Mockingbird, with mm, Gregory Peck yes. and um, Robert, young Robert Duvall. Yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, I, th I think that was one of his first... I, uh, I think first for role. me, there is... A, there is um, I, I don't like being scared. I reckon life's mm. scary enough, but there was an element of tension and, and mystery in this mm. book. Mm. And, and ultimately, it was the difference one man can make or at least try to make a difference. And uh, the father character in To Kill a Mockingbird... Atticus, yeah. ...was so... Um, clear, you know, widowed, right? Mm -hmm. Two kids. Mm -hmm. 
um, not making a lot of money uh, practicing law and really supporting the underdogs and and trying to bring justice into a world that didn't have any back then and and very little now mm. um, yeah it was just incredible and and to think that Harper Lee who wrote this I think only wrote this and then didn't write anything for the longest time and then right. and then maybe wrote something I think she wrote something eventually again that didn't land right. but sometimes you know, sometimes some artists have one incredible book. It is just a sweet spot that mm -hmm. they find, a book that changes the world. Mm -hmm. um, and and th that was this book. I like to think that there are people out there that might not be able to produce a lot that's okay, but one thing that's just unbelievable. Which is fantastic. You know when sometimes we go, oh, what, that person's just a one-hit wonder. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> they landed something, you know, so that, that's the, the hats off to them, it's great. Brilliant. You know? It's so true. We're it's, so, so, that's a, that's a, it's meant to be said in a derogatory expect. way. Wow, one, one hit wonder. Like, What's like, your point? No, no, <laughs> but where are your hits? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, where, right? where was your one yeah, hit? Yeah, yeah, You know, when was the last or, time you recorded or a song? Or even people that give it a shot and don't land and they never have a hit, but they still gave it a shot. Con like standing ovation for that, for just throwing your hat in the ring and giving it it's a whirl. It's just so we're so tiresome, you know, <laughs> like having to have opinions and be right. Oh. I was thinking about this the other day. Why everything is born out of no, I'm right. Every right. problem, yeah. every problem in a marriage, but, every problem in the world, it listen. stems out of no, I'm right, and and I will fight. Yeah, well, to, to to prove to you that I'm right, no matter what the cost. Right, right. Right? Hilarious. <laughs> You're right. I heard you. <laughs> but, the, but for me, throughout uh, all the, you know, I'm no whiz, but I, I know enough, to, I think, to be able to see through bullshit. And one thing that I've noticed, the most intelligent people, with our, through all the books that I've read or people that I've spoken to or things that I've researched, the number one common thread, which goes back to one of the greatest minds in the history of the world, let alone in Greece, Socrates. All I know is I know nothing you at know, all. You know, that was the title of my memoir, All I Know. Right. That right. was the first half of yes. that, that idea. Yes. All I know is I know nothing. Yes. You know, in a world where you've got to know everything, I'm like always the one going, um, okay, this is a dumb question. Because if you stop questioning, then, then, then you're just buying everything. Right. You know, you're just opting out. And, and some things I don't know anything about or have any interest in or go, look, just overall, I don't know whether we can solve that problem. So I'm going to go towards things that maybe I can have some impact mm, in. And, mm. um, you know, I, I'm average. I'm ha happy to say I'm average. I'm happy to say I'll give, I've got a great work ethic. I'm happy to say I'll give it a go. But chances are I'm average. It's plenty <laughs> of shit, you know. Like, I, I don't know why people feel the need to um, have such strong opinions on so much that, you know, not being, not having that flexibility mm. of changing your mind mm, mm. is, is, I don't even understand how people can be that sure of something without the idea of, you know, being able to change your mind. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm always open to hearing another point of view. Sure. You know, I, I want it. I mean, it's part of how debating is the only national sport in Greece sure. that, that has no age barrier or gender issue. Mm. You know, everyone arguing. When we first moved to Doncaster, the neighbours came in, Ruby from next door, and she says, everything all right? And we're like, well, what do you mean? And almost there's a lot of shouting. I was like, yeah, we're, we're arguing. We're, we're debating. We're actually just talking. This is yes. how we talk. Yeah. Um, but the Greeks are like that. You know, I, don't, I never see fisticuffs in Greece. Mm. You know, mm. like no matter, they're in every coffee shop. They've got a million newspapers from a, different, a million different points of view on everything. Mm. The Communist Party is still very strong in Greece. Mm. Um, you know, there's a place for difference. You know, there's a place for, you know, you, you're, you can say what you need to say and, and, and it's okay. And of course you're going to have a different point of view. You're a whole other person, you know, mm -hmm. like with that the aspires to something else. Mm -hmm. um, the common thread being the cultural one and food, smoking, um, staying up late, um, you know, work-life balance. I've always said about the Greeks, they've never had to even entertain that as a notion. That's, mm. that's just part of who they are. They're always going to make time 
to socialise, to, to share opinions, no matter how differing. You know, when you watch the news in Greece, it splits up into the Brady Bunch. The screens uh, carve up into like nine little squares and essentially you, you're, you're listening to nine different opinions. Uh, right. That's if you can hear them because <laughs> they're all screaming yeah. at the top of their lungs. But there is always a place for difference. Uh, that doesn't exist anymore. No, that, it's it's such becoming a shame. smaller and smaller, that, that I, whole... Um, that freedom to, uh, to be different. And what you just said before, I think, is, is something that sadly missed is healthy debate. You know, to have those differing views, to be able to, and accept people for their, like, when I'm back in the States, you know, I listen to a lot of different political people who are conservative, people that are liberal, um, and just hearing the different, and, and I empathise for both. Like, I, 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 I hear what they're saying, and everyone's hurting. You know, it's not like there's not like one person that's like, oh yeah, they're the big benefactor of all of this stuff. Yeah. With the people that I spoke to, like yeah. I'm, I know you take it way up, and there are people, you know, that are pulling strings and manipulating things that are, you know, probably not to the benefit of humanity or yeah. to everyone. But yeah. but across the board, it's like, but why? It seems someone says something different. All right, that's shut down. Yeah. Don't want to hear it. Yeah. And and also for people too, I think need to be. They need to feel safe in admitting to things that they once did or thought that weren't good too but now they realize like i remember that years ago there was an interview with um with liam neeson on tv and he, he was talking about a film about revenge yeah. and having that idea of revenge is so can, can be so damning to oneself and to the rest of the world and the interviewer said have you ever felt that and he goes i, I have and he gave the example of it and he said i'm ashamed for having felt this and have for what i went through but this is what I this is what I felt at the time. He was lampooned yeah, for that, yeah. and I, I just thought, well, there we go. Discussion's over. No yeah. one's going to admit this again. They're yeah. going to ruin their career, yeah. or they're going to going to be put in a position where. Hey, there's... listen. You know, like I, you know, being in the arts, we're very, you know, we're very liberal. We're very sure. open. Yes. You know, but I say liberal in in the terms of the idea of the word, not right. the party necessarily. Right. My mother, right wing. Right. You know. You can't yeah. talk her out of it. Like, that's a, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> and she'll convince you and she believes she's right. Right. My relatives on, on both sides are probably right wing. Um, right. I've grown up in, you know, it's okay. The, uh, and then sometimes she, oh, I couldn't be bothered. What you're voting for, I'm doing the same. I'm fed up. Yeah, You sure. know, or she'll literally, she, or, then, or then she'll enjoy not having a loyalty right. to any particular side. The morning after the, federal, the last federal election, she woke up. I was, I don't know where we were, um, but I was with her because we don't live in the same cities. And she woke up. She said, what happened last night? <laughs> and I said, uh, Albanese, you know, won. Ah, Lebanese. She called him Lebanese. <laughs> ah, Lebanese. Ah, bye-bye, Scotty. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye, Scotty. Oh, and he dated the suit for nothing. Remember, he did some. He did something with a child and he got his suit got mud all over oh, it. Oh, right, right. Ah, the poor thing. And he dated, <laughs> he dated the suit for nothing. You know, like, but she's so confident with who she is. It's funny because <laughs> the current stage show that um, I'm writing and, and, and performing um, is called Up Yourselfness. It's a new Effie show right. that, uh, that I'm doing. And, and it's all about if you feel good about who you are, and I mean that on every level, mm. that you're confident enough to be wrong, mm. confident enough to get something, you know, like do something wrong, confident mm. enough to allow other people that same privilege, mm. Mm. then, you know, confident enough to see all the elements that you contain that are human and interesting and yours where you come from, the way you look at the world, the fact that you can change the way you look at the world. You know, talking about the, the bitch fight, in, in, in Effie's words, between political correctness and freedom of speech mm, and mm. how that's a big fight currently. Mm -hmm. um, and, and where do we sit on that? And words have never been Effie's strength, obviously. Mm. But her intention's always been good. She was born out of a, a show that talked about race. Mm. I talked about uncomfortable things. I've always talked about uncomfortable things. Life's uncomfortable. I, I always talk about mental health issues because if you're human, you're going to have mental health issues. Sure. You know, it's not a taboo. It's part of being human. Mm -hmm. You know, um, why are we complicating life by, you know, having to 
uh, serve an agenda or an ego or something by saying, this is who I am, I'm 100% defined as this and that's all I am. And why, why do you have a problem with somebody being who they are? Are, are they actually going to harm you? Mm. Um, have they just got a different point of view? So that, uh, that whole world, I know it's something that everyone's talking about, but it seems to be the epidemic that will not go away. Right. And it's been around for almost 10 years now. And mm. when you look into where it was born from, the whole political correctness thing and the whole um, deplatforming and the whole thing coming out of these campuses in you know, American colleges and universities, places where we all you should have were looking freedom. for rebellious thoughts yes. and all of that. That's no. where you go. I mean, no. you don't go to uni for a degree. You go for that privilege. Right. Uh, and then that started um, being shut down. These armies of thought police came out and went, no, okay, we're going to start cancelling people that are human, have made mistakes or saying something that we don't actually agree with or like. Mm -hmm. and, and so the whole world just started, you know, shutting down. And I go to Greece every year um, because it's beautiful and because I want to be reminded that it's okay to disagree and it's okay to flirt with someone and it's okay... Mm to still smoke even though I don't like it all over me, but I quite like the fact that they want to do it. Sure. I think, you know, I'm not going to go out there and go human beings can't have, a, you know, certain things that they do that I don't like and, mm. and then my, and that I'm the boss of everything mm. and I'm right on everything. I don't want that burden, you know. I want to be surrounded by people that, you know, that I would never assume could change my mind that do. Sure. You know, I want to evolve. I want to... You want to you know, be challenged too. I just you know. want to be present to something else. I don't want that control. I don't, you know, I don't have it. Mm. Even if I think I've got it, I still don't have it. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're interesting conversations and I want to try, you know, make that all funny and okay. There's a, there's a book, just as you were saying that, there's a book that's a fascinating read. Um, it came out, I don't know, maybe two or three years ago called The Coddling of the American yeah. Mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah. I, I was listening to the writer of that. Yeah, um, it's, it's, he's um, a constitutional lawyer. Yes. And he talks about the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he's very much into, you know, he's a fascinating guy. Yes. And no, I, I listened to uh, an interview with him and, and I saw the amount of stuff he's written about yeah, it's this. Yeah, great. And um, yeah, it's, it's concerning. It's, it's almost like what we've done with raising children. You know, we, we're trying to avoid it, the, the realities of what the world is. And um, trying to make them think they're okay and and that they can't do anything wrong and that they should be acknowledged mm. for every breath and every thought. Mama, I, uh, Mama, I was thinking, oh, darling, you're wonderful, aren't you? I never got told. <laughs> I mean, and I was not in an abusive <laughs> relationship yeah, with my yeah. parents. But <laughs> I love you gets said more often than and or but or to and, you know, any of that. Like the I love yous, they're just thick and fast. I mean, yeah. I, I can guarantee my mother was never told that she was loved by her parents. Mm. And I could probably count the amount of times I was told I was loved by my parents and now my daughter's hearing it a thousand times a day from multiple sources and... Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, and that's just, that's a nothing example of what I'm trying to illustrate. Um, you know, you're supposed to prepare your children for the world and will the world love them and listen to them and acknowledge them to the same degree we do? And have we prepared our children for mm. the world if we're doing that constantly? And what's going to happen when they hear their first no or not good enough or next or, you know, what happens when the world ghosts them, mm -hmm. you know? No, it's so true. And, and you go... Oh, well, that, that explains the correlation between why is depression, anxiety, you know, even youth suicide, why is that skyrocketing compared to previous years? Because as a parent, you want to prepare your kid for the world and by giving them a trophy for, you know, for going and picking up their shoes, that ain't, you know, that ain't preparing them for nothing, you know. And, for, and, and the world is, a, you know, it's a, yeah, it's, it's, it is a challenging place, but... I think if you go into it, it's, you know, it's like the, the Nietzsche approach, you know, to expect things to go wrong, to expect not everything to flow. And then when it does happen, yeah, okay, you know, that, of course that's going to happen. That's the, way, that's the way life is. But what are you going to do about it now? You know, as opposed to everything is great, everything's going to be fine. That person cut me off in traffic, so now that's going to ruin my day. Yeah, look, I'm all for optimism, but I'm all for realism as well. Likewise. So, yeah. you know, there, there's nothing worse than a pessimist, although they are funny. You know, <laughs> like uh, a lot of Woody Allen's early films, uh, yes. there's just nothing but 
<laughs> hilarious jokes wrapped around pessimism right. and neurosis and all that sort of stuff. I love the Jewish humour. I should have been Jewish. Um, you know, I, the Greeks are funny, but they're sort of, they're theatrically funny. Mm. The, the, the Jewish people actually have genius dialogue, mm. um, you know, and so, uh, I, I mean, yeah, you don't want to say the world's a, a horrible, hard place out there, no, even no, though it can be. Yeah, but you want to be prepared for that too. But, but you, the, want every, you want every note sort of, you know, touched on yeah. with, with a kid because you don't want to overwhelm them, but you don't want them to, to think it's all about unicorns and glitter and all sure. those other things. And sometimes there's beauty in that. In the, like, I remember the first time listening to uh, Tom Waits' album, Small Change, and just hearing about these characters in it that were downtrodden and, you know, the, 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 they would be looked upon as someone you would walk by in the street and go, who's that bum, you know? But they're the people that actually from that they see the beauty, you know? You know, it's, it's, it's from that... Uh, it's like a Bukowski poem, like uh, from. Oh, you're pulling all the same references uh, look, look that it. I had. Oh my oh, god! Oh yeah? yeah, you can't be my age. <laughs> yeah. Oh but, my. God. But that, but that for me gives you an insight into the into the the real beauty in life. You know, from that downtrodden place, they can really see, and it's not beauty on a superficial level. It's seeing the beauty in someone or something that would normally be tossed to the wayside. Well, listen, in my darkest moments, you know, when I was um, so overwhelmed with grief and in the trenches um, of uh, heartbreak, um, I remember in being in hospital and looking up and, and I just, I remember thinking, just lift your head up and, and, and see what you, you know, really see what you're looking at. Mm. And, and there were doctors and nurses and everyone was trying to do their best for me. They had no skin in my game. That was just their job. Mm. And, and, you know, and I saw that, you know, even in, in that horrible situation that I, you know, I had to live through and um, mm. I, I saw good. Mm. And that's important. And, you know, and even from the lowest, you know, I, I say this about growing up working class. You know, the only way is up, baby, from there, mm. you know. Mm. Um, and I loved it. I didn't feel like growing up in Collingwood that, that, that we didn't have everything we needed. Mm -hmm. But there was an even playing field and that was a really liberating feeling and I felt like anything was possible from there because I sort of learnt everything grassroots because I had access to, you know, we were living so close together and everyone lived in the front of their house even though I lived on a main road. The Greeks love a little vinyl couch on, sure. the, on the anorexic veranda at the front so they can keep an eye on everything, a bit like do the right thing or something. You know, everyone lives on the stoop. They've yes. got to see the yes. action, right? Yes. So... Um, I felt like I got, you know, a PhD in, in society mm. starting there, you know. And then I, when I went into the middle class, I felt like it was the antithesis of that, mm. where everything was locked away all the time. Up, you could drive up the driveway into the garage, lock it away. Yeah, we're done. Sure, sure. Lock it down now. We're done for yeah, the day. Compound lockdown. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as my father-in-law says, Australia is a prison with the doors open. Mm. And that's because there are no town squares where you all meet every night, where the kids play every night. Sure. There is, you know, everyone just drives into their home and closes away the world mm. and lives through a screen. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be television, now it's, you know, any other screen. Um, so I, I like to look at society. I like to hear it. I like to, all the flavours of it, all the differences in it, you know, that's, that's the world. Sure. It's not through... Um, a world that is curated through different um, Instagram posts or television regimes or what mm -hmm. whatever. It's 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 what you see for real, 3D, spontaneous, in the moment, people mixing, and you know trying to get through their day, trying mm. to get onto the other side. And there's a lot of good in that. Mm. It's good to see that. You know, you feel seen by that. You feel stimulated by it. You feel comforted by it. It still is one of the few parts of what's real. Mm -hmm. And um, and we're 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 disadvantaged by not having access to that more and more in the way we live. Sure, but th that's why I think it puts so much of a priority on live performance too. Like for you, you grew up in that sense of community, and you really feel that at your shows. You feel a sense of community that you create within your audience, and you know that's uh, I feel that that's one of the final refuges to go to to yeah. live performance to feel that sense of connection and community with others as well. And I look forward to experiencing that with your new show. Oh. <laughs>
Thank you, Joel. Well, thank you for I love today. You. You're was, awesome. No, I love you, I love you, I love no, you, I love you. Thanks, Mary. Likewise. Thank you for taking the time to do this. This was great. Really enjoyed it. Love it. Thank you.